thank you for coming. Thank you for remaining. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm the executive director of the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative, and I bring press conferences to life at the UN climate negotiations, the COPs, every year. And I call them Climate Matters. It's a press conference with a difference. It's a talk TV show, very serious subject matter. So I'm your host. We're coming to you live from COP23 in Bonn, Germany, of which Fiji is the honorary president of this year's COP. I always like to give my email address at the beginning and end of my my shows so that people can contact me afterward. And I've never gotten any hate mail, so please, that's what it's there for. I'll show it again at the end. Now, today's guest with us is Dr. Philip Lawn. He has a long list of credentials. He's associated with the Center of Full Employment and Equity, Binzager? Binzager. Binzager Institute, for Sustainable Prosperity, Wakefield Futures Group, and the International Society for Ecological Economics. And let me highlight those words. We're talking today about ecological economics. I've titled today's show, Addiction to Growth, the Root Cause of Climate Change. It's the elephant in the room. It's the thing we're not talking about. Greenhouse gas emissions are the delivery mechanism for climate change, but the root cause is our addiction to growth. And I'm also subtitling this a primer in ecological economics. We'll do three altogether, two more after today on the subject of ecological economics this week. I'm going to give the microphone over to my colleague, Philip. Thank you, Stuart. Um, the message I want to project today is one that you're unlikely to hear from any other presentation at this conference. And the reason for that is that uh, there is, as Stuart said, there's an, a global addiction to growth. And as a consequence, despite it being a root cause of uh, climate change problems and other environmental and social problems around the world, it's a topic that's largely been avoided. Uh, and that's due to the fact that the growth of the economy is civilization's primary goal. Now, it may not be your goal, but collectively, that is civilization's primary goal. And advance it will with that okay. arrow. All right, thanks. Uh, and what is undeniable is the fact that despite technological progress, which can reduce our demands on resources or the intensity of resource use, growth of the economy requires more resources. Look at any diagram showing resource use over time and it, it's on the rise. So growth requires more resources. Growth generates more waste, including greenhouse gases. Current growth is ecologically unsustainable. How do we know that? If I just move, uh, which of course means, sorry, it's inconsistent with sustainable development. If we just look, I don't know if you've heard of this particular indicator before, it's called an ecological footprint. It represents humankind's demands on resource stocks and waste sinks. And the green line that you can see there at number one, that represents the global biocapacity. One Earth. We have one Earth to provide the resources and to absorb uh, pollution as well as greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see that from 1961, when the global ecological footprint was below global biocapacity, so at that point in time, the, uh, the world was operating with a ecological surplus. We're now in a position, uh, that was at 2013, where we have a, a massive ecological deficit. Uh, currently, the ratio of uh, ecological footprint to global biocapacity is 1.7. What does that mean? That effectively means that uh, at present, the uh, resource demands, the current resource demands uh, of the global economy, if they were to be sustained over time, we would require 1.7 Earths. We only have one Earth. So it's unsustainable. And it's increasing. And it's increasing. It's increasing. Uh, and 
Uh, as a consequence, uh, this ratio, if the global economy grows at expected levels into, to up until 2100, despite or uh, with uh, quite significant increases in technological progress, is likely to grow beyond three. So we would need three planets in order to sustain the level of resource demand and our demands on waste sinks at the end of this century. I doubt very much if that can be achieved at all without ecological uh, catastrophe. Uh, so this is not just about climate change. Climate change is the first, it's the leading edge of our destruction of the biosphere. If it weren't climate change, there are other things close behind. The nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the hydrological cycle, the acidification, the, the hypoxic zones in the ocean. We are killing the planet. Now, growth is assumed, is presumed to be our birthright in the industrialized nations of the world and in the developing nations of the world. We have to, in the industrialized nations, as my colleague will say later, we have to limit our growth so that the developing world can grow more. We need to give them more room to grow by reducing our footprint on the mm -hmm. planet. I'm sorry. That's okay. So excessive demand on global resources and waste sinks has uh, led to a lot of problems uh, that we're quite familiar with. Uh, that's deforestation and land degradation, resource depletion and biodiversity loss, uh, worker exploitation to maintain the growth of the global economy. Uh, and through international trade, income inequality, uh, both within and between nations, and of course climate change. Meaning, of course, uh, that overall climate change is just one symptom of a larger problem. It is not a separate problem in itself, and in a lot of the uh, uh, United Nations uh, uh, climate change conferences, climate change is dealt with as if it is an independent problem. It is a symptom of a much larger problem. If we think we can resolve the climate change crisis and continue to grow the global economy uh, as expected to the end of the century, we are delusional. It cannot be achieved. The uh, commitments that have been made, even the Paris uh, commitments, which of course are insufficient, uh, are unlikely to be met if we continue with growth of the economy. And this is due to our addiction to growth. Okay, does that mean that climate change agreements are futile? Well, of course they're critical for a number of reasons. They help us to set targets and make meaningful commitments. That's important. Uh, but these climate change targets will not be met if we continue to grow the global economy, as I said before, at current rates. Uh, continued global, global uh, growth uh, and the dramatic reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are required, of course, to uh, resolve the climate change crisis, are completely incompatible. You can't have both. Uh, so, if that means we can't have continued growth to achieve our climate change uh, targets uh, and objectives, what does that mean? Well, it means, of course, for high-income countries, they must reduce consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, should this be a concern? Of course, a lot of people will say, okay, if, uh, if the uh, high-income countries have less consumption, won't that make life better off, or sorry, worse off for people in, in high-income countries? No, that uh, need not be the case. And if I can just move quickly to, uh, I think I might just move on quickly, Please. Stuart, to the, uh, the genuine progress indicator uh, before I get back to some of these points here. Um, Sorry. Uh, You're skipping over a lot of stuff. Sorry, I'll go back to this. Okay. I, I would like to there do that. There's, there's an indicator called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Uh, there's another one that you might be familiar with. That's the Gross Domestic Product. Gross Domestic Product is the conventional means of measuring the uh, success of an economy. It's uh, the wrong compass to be using to judge the uh, progress of a country. The people who came, the person who came up with GDP said that it is being misapplied. It is not meant to measure success. But the bean counter, shall we say, the bankers, the economists, the growth economists have all latched onto this and it has become the law of the land, so to speak, the law of the global mm -hmm. commons. 
So gross domestic product is essentially a measure, a monetary measure of the physical volume of economic activity. And when the physical volume of economic activity goes up, it's assumed that we're better off. Irrespective of whether the increase is beneficial, it's costly, whether there's high unemployment, low unemployment, there's a growing gap between rich and poor, it doesn't matter. As long as the GDP is going up, it's considered that we're uh, better off. I was once told that a, an oil tanker which does not make its destination and unload is better for the GDP of the country than one that makes it there. An oil spill makes for more economic growth. Mm. Actually, can I mention that at the, at the state or provincial level, it's called gross state product. And when the Exxon Valdez uh, spilled its oil in Alaska uh, some 20, 25 years ago, uh, and the uh, US federal government allocated uh, extra resources to clean up the mess, the gross state product of Alaska spiked. So it went up. Uh, so uh, if you're just going by gross state product, it would indicate or suggest that the well-being of Alaska rose when, of course, at the very best, the uh, environment of Alaska, the Alaskan coast, was restored somewhere near what it was previously. So it's an inadequate or in inappropriate guide to the progress of a, a state or a nation. I just have to say GDP is a brain-dead measure of progress. Mm. So, so what does the uh, genuine progress indicator do? It separate, separates out the benefits and the costs of economic activity. You add the benefits, you subtract the costs. And the reason why I've, I've gone ahead to this is because uh, I don't know how well that uh, appears on the screen, but I've got uh, on in blue is gross domestic product and in red is the genuine progress indicator. And this is very common. The genuine progress indicator goes up with the gross domestic product until gross domestic product reaches a threshold level. Beyond that threshold level, the GPI, or the Genuine Progress Indicator, levels out or falls, suggesting that any additional uh, gross domestic product is futile. In fact, it makes us worse off. It provides very few additional benefits, but of course, since it's a great, or represents a greater volume of economic activity, it imposes greater costs, both, in, both environmentally and socially, and of course, in terms of its impact on the Earth's climate system. Now, I, I want to interject that I believe, my position is that one of the reasons that we are anchored to this GDP is because banks and bankers and stock markets, the financial sector, benefits singularly no matter what the costs are. They have to lend more money for the cleanup, lend more money for the building of the new ship. So the bankers are incented to use GDP, because they're always going to make more money as the GDP grows. So the question is, you know, will it, uh, given that high income countries have to need to reduce their consumption, would, which would basically mean halt the uh, rise in GDP, will it make high income countries worse off? Well, the genuine progress indicator indicates or suggests that growth of GDP is not making people in high income countries better off. So. Uh, it means that if consumption was reduced and there was a greater emphasis on, and I'll go back to some of these slides where I talk about uh, some of the things that uh, should be done, uh, undertaken by wealthy countries. I think I seem to have lost that, Stuart. Um, no. It... Oh, okay. Uh, there we go. What did you want to do? I want to go back to what, okay, yes, what high income countries need to do. They need to reduce their consumption in greenhouse gas emissions. It won't make them worse off. Growth in consumption in greenhouse gas emissions is already making high income countries worse off. So what uh, should they be doing instead? They should be uh, to achieve sustainable development and to meet their greenhouse gas emissions targets. They need to focus on a number of things, a better distribution of income and wealth. I asked the question, is there enough GDP being produced in the USA to have full employment in the USA? Uh, I, I'm not picking on the USA here. No, so please, pick on the USA. Uh, we are but, the pariah of the world yeah. right now. But is there enough GDP in the USA to have full employment in the USA and for every person in the USA to live a meaningful, purposeful uh, happy life? And of course, the answer is yes. And indeed, well, no, excuse me, not if you're Donald Trump. Well, we need more Trump Towers in more cities. Okay. 
Well, I'll show you what uh, more Trump towers and more Trump cities. I've just, in fact, shall I? No, I won't go back. To, uh, the genuine progress indicator suggests that that hasn't made us uh, better. Just go off. with your presentation. Excuse my comments. Okay, I've just lost the slide. Okay, but if not, what? Uh, so a better distribution of in income and wealth. One of the great problems in countries, not just like the USA, uh, in my home country, Australia, we're finding that the gap between rich and poor is rising. And so as the GDP rises, more of that extra GDP is going to people who do not gain a great deal of benefit from their additional consumption. But those at the lower end of the scale, their re uh, reduced consumption is having an enormous impact on their well-being. So a better distribution of uh, uh, income and wealth, uh, an improvement in the quality of goods produced. GDP, increasing GDP is about producing more goods. We don't need to produce more goods, but we can produce better goods. Uh, is an individual human uh, being, uh, have, or does an individual re, uh, human being reach their or his or her full development potential at age 20 because they stop growing? Of course they don't. Growth is the uh, early stage of a development process. It's an important part of, an, uh, of the development process. But then growth should stabilise uh, the scale of whatever it is, uh, whether it be a human being, whether it be an ecosystem, an economy, needs to uh, remain at a steady physical state. And then there needs to be an emphasis on, on improving what constitutes part of the goods that make up the economy. Uh, I, I wanted to interject something. A gentleman who's a mentor for both of us, Dr. Herman Daly, who is credited as being the founder or the father of ecological economics, he makes the differentiation between growth in the scale of the economy, growth in the material footprint, uh, uh, throughput of the economy, and, and qualitative growth, more services. You don't need a new phone every year or every two years as they obsolete them so quickly in order to reach your your full capacity a phone will do it but that then you are talking about making better phones less material throughput more jobs more quality more long live live it's it's a difference between how much stuff we're going to build and throw away and how good we're going to make the stuff that we live with and be satisfied with it so, so the emphasis should uh, uh, move away from producing more goods to better goods and also considering how we produce those goods, how we organise ourselves to produce those goods. If we better organise the way we produce goods, we can reduce unemployment. And better still, we should be aiming for full employment. Uh, of course, it's important to use natural resources more efficiently. So trying to minimise the amount of resources used to maintain the stock of goods uh, that we have at our disposal. And of course, it's important to keep natural capital. And by natural capital, I'm talking about the forests and the fisheries and so forth, healthy and intact. The atmosphere. The atmosphere, the climate uh, system, the, the, uh, the Earth's climate system. What would be the, uh, the result of these uh, advances? Well, of course, some of those advances would increase the benefit of a given amount of economic activity and lower the costs. What happens when you increase the benefits and lower the costs for a given level of economic activity or given level of gross domestic product? The genuine progress indicator goes up because the, the, the genuine progress indicator is the difference between the benefits and the costs of economic production and consumption. So this would create genuine progress without the need for growth. So we don't need the additional growth to be better off. And in fact, it's making us worse off. And as Stuart said, that would provide the low income, the low to middle income countries, the space, the room to be able to grow their economies to enjoy some increase in their well-being prior to them, of course, having to do what high income countries will have uh, need to do immediately, and that is to uh, limit their consumption and their uh, use of resources, waste and greenhouse gas emissions. So I'll just jump. Uh, through this because I've gone through this. So low and middle income countries need some growth of the economy to alleviate poverty. They do need some growth. Rich countries need to provide them with the room to enjoy some growth. 
but it needs to be as efficient and uh, as equitably distributed as possible. Why? Well, uh, in order for low and middle income countries to get the most out of the growth that they have, it needs to be distributed equitably across society. And if it's done efficiently, it will reduce the resource demands. Uh, so that growth is going to have some impact on the natural environment, but it can be lessened if the natural resources are used, that are used to produce that uh, gross domestic product, that growing gross domestic product, are used in the most efficient way possible. And here is where rich countries need to play a part because uh, in particular in the case of uh, climate change, climate change finance is important to, um, to uh, assist in particular low income countries to be able to produce efficiently. That means a transfer of technology in many cases to be able to utilise the most up-to-date technology to use and uh, uh, utilise resources in the most efficient manner. Of course, low and middle income countries, after they've had their period of uh, growth in GDP, up to the point where the GPI uh, reaches a maximum, once you get to that point where further GDP does not grow the GPI, they will too have to uh, reduce their resource consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Let me repeat that in plain terms. You come to a point where growing the throughput, growing the material wealth of a country does not increase the welfare of the individual. And when you get to that point, you should stop growing, be happy with what you've got. But that's not taught in our business schools. Universally, pretty much to a one, universities in their economics department teach something called neoclassical growth economics. If ecological economics is taught in that university, it's usually taught in another department because it's heterodox. It's, it undercuts the assumptions of the mainstream paradigm of growth. We all must grow. It's taught in the sustainability department. It's, okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, well, low and middle income countries, yes, they uh, need to be given the room, the space. And of course, we know through uh, the Paris Agreement that uh, low income countries have been given the opportunity to grow their greenhouse gas emissions somewhat. Uh, and that's based on uh, what was said in the previous uh, presentation about the fact it needs to be a common but uh, differentiated convergence approach to uh, emissions rights, which would mean the rich countries reduce their greenhouse gas emissions uh, to allow poor countries to have some increase before they too have to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, which is likely to be a point in time where low to middle income countries will eventually be subject to greenhouse gas emissions targets. But right now, low to middle income countries or low and middle income uh, countries need to do something about population growth. Uh, that needs to be done. It can be done and can be done in ways that aren't anti-immigrant and aren't racist based. And they need to be done because at present, well, I'm 53 years of age and during my lifetime, the world's population has doubled. It's only grown at about 1%, 1, 1.5% 1, 1 per year. It doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, the population growing at 1, 1.5% 1 per year means a doubling every 50 years. The important thing about that is that if the population, the global population was to fall by 1 or 1.5% per year, which doesn't sound like a lot, we could halve the world's population in 50 years. So that can be reversed fairly quickly and it doesn't require harsh policies to do that. And it's something that should be uh, uh, discussed. And of course, it's something that quite often is not discussed in development conferences and climate change conferences. The more people there are on the planet, even if per capita emissions remain the same, total emissions go up. The more difficult it is for countries and the global community to reach emissions targets. And of course, it's important in terms of the welfare of current uh, and future generations. Shall I go? We're going to have to go either very quickly okay. or skip them. Uh, all right. Well, we, we have three minutes left. All right. Uh, well, I'll just go through this briefly. Uh, in fact, I won't go through these. Skip over them. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I've got some, can I just go through this? I, I want to put this in perspective, this, this, the reason why growth is important. 
Let's consider the Paris Agreement. I haven't got this on a slide, sorry. Uh, but high, high income countries, of course, have committed to ver various greenhouse gas emission cuts. But collectively, and they differ from country to country, but collectively, uh, essentially high income countries have promised by 2030 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25 to 30% relative to 2005 levels. Right, 2030 to reduce them by 25 to 30% relative to 2005 levels. Here's the question. What if per capita gross domestic product of high income countries was now what it was 35 years ago when the genuine progress indicator peaked and when GDP growth became futile? Okay. Even without the technological progress that we've had, uh, high income nations would have already met their Paris uh, emissions cuts, the emissions targets. They would all, right now, not by 2030, right now, 2017, they would have, uh, that the greenhouse gas emissions would be 25, 30% less than 2005 levels. Now I'm going That's, to have to uh, interrupt in a moment okay. if we're going to even mention your book. Oh. So I'll encourage people, we're going to have Dr. Lawn with us again at the same time tomorrow. We'll continue. Perhaps we'll work some of these into the slides, but I didn't want to leave without getting a close-up, perhaps, perhaps from one of our cameras of, of his book. He has written not the book, but a book about the resolving the climate change crisis with the aid of a new paradigm, a new economic paradigm, ecological economics. So I'm sorry to, to cut right. you off, but the UN will do it if I don't. <laughs> OK, no problem. Well, we can perhaps go on and talk about some of this tomorrow. Maybe, yes, maybe. Yeah. Work them into a slide for tomorrow. tomorrow. Now, again, I've been your host. Stuart Scott's my name. And here's my email address, as I promise every day. So please write with questions if you have any questions for myself or for, for Philip. And I'll pass them on. Can, can I just? Just, you've got five seconds to. I'm not trying to promote. I haven't have come here to promote seconds. my book, but uh, I've got some flyers if, uh, that I'll just put. Uh, well, perhaps I have to leave outside if people want to pick up the flyer. Don't be <laughs> put off too much by the price. Apparently, you can get it about half the price that's on the flyer if you get it from Amazon.com. Okay, it's a textbook, and we know, all know what textbooks do. It's not do. a textbook. Though. No? Okay, I'm sorry. But, the but publishers it, need to pay, uh, pay for their overhead. <laughs> but let me, before we go, I would like to say, please, if you would like to vote for true sustainability, go to np4sd.org. Take a photo of that, if you like. It is a Nobel Peace Prize proposal that would essentially elevate the stature of ecological economics in the world. Thank you very much for coming.